she's a wonderfully nice person, but I think um, Nook has done a really exceptional job of merchandising apps. And I think Claudia was probably one of the first people that I heard um, talk using this term. And um, you know, really, we're covering um, different approaches to discovery and distribution this morning. And I asked Claudia if she would spend um, a few minutes with us um, this morning um, talking a little bit about how Nook approaches um, uh, uh, merchandising of apps. And it's, a, it's a process because it involves um, identifying developers and then bringing them onto the store and a lot of um, opportunity to use Tomer's term um, for, for developers, not only on the device, um, but in their uh, physical retail outlet. So, um, Claudia, welcome. Thank you. So, what I wanted to focus on when Trevor asked me to talk about merchandising is some of the unique sort of characteristics of our approach. Um, we, you probably all hopefully know who Barnes & Noble is. We have uh, about 1,300 retail stores in the United States. Um, we just recently launched in the UK, um, where we actually are distributing to about 2,500 retail outlets. So we don't have our own stores there, but we're selling through major retailers. So we, we're very new in the international world, but we're, we're sort of dipping our toes now, and we're very excited about it. Um, and, and we have some challenges, because we've been selling books for many, many years, and we know readers, we know customers, but the digital world is new to us, and we're learning a lot in terms of what um, has been happening with the sort of book and publishing world, and we're taking a lot of the those experiences, those successes, and bringing them to digital content. Um, so, can you go to the next slide, please? <coughs> so, what I want to touch on is really in terms of what have, what have we learned um, in selling books and other types of digital content, how that reflects on success in selling apps, um, and then how does that affect actually how we organize apps and our taxonomy and, and reflect the, again on merchandising and curation, which I think all these things are tied together, they're very important. I'm only going to touch on a few of our sort of most important points. Um, I can talk to you later about some of the others. Um, there's a lot of interesting things going on right now in our market and uh, sort of our space with apps. You go to the next slide. So this is kind of an interesting little test that we've been doing recently. So these are two user reviews on two types of digital content in our store. Um, one's a book and one's an app. Um, I'm not sure if you can tell the difference. I'm not gonna tell you at this point what, what is what. Um, the point of this sort of little quiz is the fact that um, when we look at how users think about content, we realize that there's really no difference for them between a book, an app, a magazine, a movie. They don't really know how to tell the difference. They don't care, right? They're just purchasing content to enjoy. Um, so for us, it's really important to think of it that way. We talk a lot, we're all um, sort of experts in the app industry. But when you bring apps into the world of what a customer or a consumer looks at, it, they, for them, they just don't really want to hear how we position apps. They just want to say, okay, am I going to enjoy this? Is it a great piece of content? Does it have the right functionality? So really what we don't want to do is draw sort of artificial lines in the sand between different types of content. Um, and I'll tell you that one of these quotes was for Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, yeah, we for an app, a very popular app that we all talk about all the time. Anyways, um, I'll go to the next slide. Wait, you should ask how many people have read it. All right. It's the best-selling book in our store and has been for months, so I'm sure a lot of people have read it. Um, so, um, even though they don't want to disclose it. Right, I was going to say, where's your So, um, the other interesting thing is that, you know, we, again, being all in the app world, and I'm sure we're all techies, I'm just judging by the conversation we've been having so far, and, you know, we live and breathe this world, I've been in the industry for 25 years, um, we don't really think, tend to think about the fact that there's a lot of nuances in customers and consumers, and this is something that's become a reality for me in selling apps to our, our type of customer. The, the typical customer or mobile, or mobile customer is really, at this point still, um, you know, typically male and um, under the age of 35. It's, it's slowly evolving and changing, but it, it's typically that is what it is. And this is actually not just smartphones, this is actually tablet statistics as well from Nielsen. Uh, can you click, please? Our typical customer is very different. Still today, even though we've just recently launched two new tablets, we think that the market is going to change with these new tablets, um, it's very female focused. Over 70% of our customers are women. 
um, which is very reflective of our customer for books, by the way. Um, and they're between the ages of 35 and 54 in the case of Nook Tablet, so we're over 35 for Nook Color. So it hasn't really changed much because Nook Color was our first product, Nook Tablet was our second um, full color tablet. Um, can you go to the next slide? And we, we like to actually take sort of our understanding of our customer a little bit step further, and, and we've given her a name. Her name is Julie. Um, and uh, some people <coughs> joke about this, but we take this very seriously because what we want to do is put a name and a face and really an understanding of who this customer is and what she likes to do and who she is. So she's a mom, she has kids, she consumes content for herself, and she likes to share the device with her kids. Um, and again, this is something that we have been looking at very closely in the last year is this notion that a tablet is shared in the family. It's not my device. I don't put it down and, you know, I have a seven and a half year old daughter. Half the time the device is off to her bedroom and I don't even see it. It's gone and she's accessing her content, her apps, her books on it as well. So it's a very much a shared experience. And the other point of this is that it's, it's really, customers don't think about technology, right? Everything should be dead brain simple for them. And so we don't want to design a product where it's overcomplicated or apps are overcomplicated because for them, the content and the experience should be very simple, very transparent, very clean. Almost like reading a book. I mean, do you think about how you read a book? No, you open it, you start reading it. That's exactly how we're thinking about apps. Um, and the other point is that consumers, they're not thinking about content in a linear way. So they're not thinking, I'm going to download a book today and I'm going to read it. And then when I'm done reading it, I'm going to think about the next book I read. Um, they actually think, I love this book, right as they're on page two or three. Is there any more content like this? Or is there another book by this author that I'd like to read? So they're immersed in their content, their favorite content, and they're already thinking about their next great read, their next purchase. Um, and so we have to think about making recommendations and driving purchases within the content, not just outside of it. In a, in a very subtle way, because consumers don't want to be marketed to and sold to while they're enjoying their, their book. Um, and, and furthermore, can you click again? Sorry, I have a lot of bills in this deck. Um, they, you know, when you look at what a customer is reading, they're, they're not just reading one book, right? Their world is made up of a lot of interests, a lot of things that they care about. So if you think about what they care about, they, they care about their entire sort of library of content. And I want to extend this to apps and movies and magazines. Like, what, what am I about? I'm about everything that I read and consume. So when we think about apps, we don't think about them in the context of the top 10 apps that everybody's buying. We think about what is our customer buying in terms of content, and how can that relate to the kinds of apps that they might be interested in. And that really influences the way that we've designed our merchandising model for apps. Um, on the book side, we've introduced a concept called instant collections. So instead of merchandising books by categories, do you ever go into a bookstore and think, I'm going to look at this section and I'm going to find a book that I care about by this author? Sometimes. But in general, you walk in with an interest in something, a topic, or, or a, a number of authors that you care about, and you sort of browse the store in that way. So collections allows you to do that in a digital form. So if you care about I don't know, football or baseball, you can actually find an instant collection of books all about this topic. And it's curated by our booksellers, not in terms of just this topic, but other related topics that you might care about because you're, you're interested in that in sports, for example. Um, and, and we're extending uh, this collections concept to all digital content now. So even apps is going to be organized in this way. So rather than thinking of, you know, a customer discovering apps by category, so I'm going to look at children's apps or I'm going to look at, you know, uh, food apps or whatever. I, we're just going to think about what is the topic of interest that they care about based on their purchasing uh, history and recommendations and our bookseller experience, and that's what we're going to present to them in terms of app collections. Um, and I mentioned Julie and that she's part of a family unit. Um, so this model of consumption where I buy a tablet and I share it with my family, with my husband and my daughter, is really important in terms of the UI and how the device is actually sort of, imp how the user experience is implemented on the device. So recently, with our new devices, we've actually introduced the concept of profiles. I had a demo of it, I had to take it out because it wasn't running on this computer, but the point is that 
when you turn on uh, a no HD, you can actually configure it so that you are using it with your content, your kids are using it with their content, your husband is accessing whatever, you know, whatever they want, whatever he wants. So the idea is that the family can actually share the device and content is profiled and organized by each type of user. And that my daughter doesn't access 50 Shades of Grey or whatever is on my device that I might be reading. Um, so we've actually put in filtering and parental controls um, to deliver a really safe experience for the parent and the child. So this is really important. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and this is based on research that we've actually done of our customers. It's not just based on the fact that we know who Julie is, but really in terms of some of this, um, the challenges that parents face um, with tablets. Um, you know, we know that they share the devices. We know that um, half told us that they would never let their child handle the, the device unattended because they're uncomfortable with some of the content on the device. And more than a third say, gee, I have content that I don't want anyone else to see. Um, so there's this sort of dichotomy, this challenge of I want to share it because it's a learning tool, but I can't. So that's what our user profile, our Nook profiles um, addresses. In terms of the app taxonomy, as I said, we don't like to organize apps by categories. We do anyways because it's a way for customers to discover content, but we're moving further and further away from it. So in our new um, department homepage for apps, we've actually reorganized it recently to focus on this concept of collections or channels as we call them. And even though categories are there, they're more difficult to find. Um, if a customer really wants to go and, find, and browse the store that way, they can, or if they want to just search for a particular app, they can. But in general, our entire UI is presented um, in a very curated approach with these channels. Um, and even when we think about categories, we think about categories in terms of what customers might be looking for. Um, one of the things we learned is that for kids, um, there's really not a good app taxonomy out there today. At least that's what we think. Um, in, in, even on iOS, it's hard to find apps for children. They're curated, they're there, but they're pretty buried. Um, sorry, yeah. How are, you, how are you distinguishing, by definition, um, kids? No, sorry, no. Um, channels versus categories. Yeah, that's, oh, those yeah. Are categories. I can show you. I actually have a device with me, so I can show you later. Um, the channels are really curated by us, so that we have a powerful search algorithm that we build. Those curated categories. Um, they're, they're, we, we actually select the channels, we select the topics. Right by profiles, by customer <coughs> profiles, and then we curate them and we run an algorithm, expansion algorithm against them to find apps in our catalog that match that particular. So you say it's dynamic model. based on a user profile. It, it's yes, well, it partially. So there's a lot going on in terms of a channel. It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, it's actually a really sophisticated algorithm that we've just recently implemented in our um, catalog. Um, so yeah, so these are categories that you're seeing. These are not actually. So what um, can you just give an example of what like one of your popular channels is? is it like so we just implemented it. Our device right. shipped yesterday. So we don't know what popular is going to be yet right. because it just started. Um, but we have things like you know best the best example is apps um, for kids who want to learn. So versus apps for kids who want to play, <laughs> because there's a difference, right? So before, if you went into children. Um, in our, even in our store, you would find Angry Birds would, would be the best-selling app, and that's really not what parents are looking for for their child. Um, we have apps for people who travel, right? So they're looking for different kinds of apps. We just recently implement one, implemented one just for men. So it would have like everything to do with media apps and games and things that we, or sports that we think you know our customers, the male customer, would be interested in. So they're more by profile, but again, it's a brand new uh, model for us, and we're going to be we, we get a lot of data from it, so as we see how customers are responding to it, we're going to be evolving them. Um, and, in, and there's a digital angle to it, so our, our algorithm actually, we have a special tool that gives us the data and allows us to change and evolve it as we go forward. So would it be fair to just characterize it more as like a lifestyle grouping? It could be a lifestyle, it could be an interest. They can be very deep, very, very deep. Yeah, it depends on you know what you, what you want to drive sort of to your customer, yeah. Um, and it changes, so your your no HD would look different than mine because of what you're buying. So you would see the completely different channels than I would. Okay. Um, so on the kids um, side, we actually learned last year that, as I mentioned, we were seeing best-selling apps under children that were not really the kinds of apps that parents were looking for. 
So we actually reorganized our entire category for apps for kids ages 0 through 12 in a very curated learning approach. Um, and we're sort of forcing, if you will, um, the learning model onto the children's category and we are segregating apps that are more games for kids from apps that are more learning for kids. Um, and this was very, that has been very successful for us and now we're able to actually match it with our no profiles so that when a parent sets up a child's profile, the apps that are learning apps for kids take priority, um, which is a great opportunity for merchandising for developers who are in that space. So this, these are some of the, this is the example of the categories that we now have. And we've replicated our, it's called our BN at School model, which is a, a dedicated area of our website for teachers. We took those learning topics and we matched them to the app store and we made sure that apps were organized in the same way. What would, you know, what parents and teachers would expect. Good question. Yeah. Do you do much to work with the developers to curate based on privacy or security settings? That might yes. We actually require now that if you have an app um, targeted at children ages 0 to 12, you answer some privacy and security questions, and we we act on that. So if you don't answer the questions correctly, and if we don't think that you you have the right privacy policies, we would reject your app and, and tell you what you need to do to make it safer for our, for, you know, for our parents, for uh, customers. So finally, um, sort of the other aspect of, you know, so there's app taxonomy and curation. What we're seeing is the model that we've implemented is resulting in, first of all, a three to four X revenue return for our developers versus, so they have an app in our store versus apps, the same app they would have in other stores. So they're seeing a return on their investment based on the fact that we're very curated and that we're able to surface their app and present it to customers. So it's a very targeted curation and merchandising model. It's getting more and more targeted. Our new model that we've just implemented, we believe will take this even further because it's, it really hones in. So for example, what we're talking about before, specific customer interests. If, I, if we have a family and a parent who has an autistic child or a child with learning disabilities, they're not going to buy our tablet if we don't have apps that cater to their needs because we know it's a family device. We know they'll share it with their children. So if we spent all of last year focusing on apps for children with learning disabilities and making sure they're there. But that's not enough. We actually have to curate them and make sure that they surface so parents know exactly where to go find them. So that's kind of an example of how our curation can drive um, sales for a developer, return on the investment for a developer who's very focused on a specific need um, or a specific type of app. Um, and this model is really encouraging developers to come and work with us across all categories. We don't necessarily need to, frankly, pay developers. Um, we're, we're showing them how they can actually um, see returns just simply by curating with us and by being on the device and being able to be in this model, um, be part of this, this sort of the store strategy. I assume you have a rev share, right? Oh yes, 70-30. Yes, we, we are a very traditional app store in terms of the, the business model, um, but we are very uh, modern, if you will, and not traditional in terms of the taxonomy and the, and the curation model. That's what we really care about. So do you have specific, it sounds like a specific focus area, like for a while you're, you were focusing on apps for children and children with learning disabilities. So are, do you have like almost like a, a roadmap or a sprint, like this yeah. time we're gonna focus on these types of apps and these types of apps and these well, types of apps? We are very much about our consumer. Our customer is sure. the general consumer, right? So obviously apps that would fit consumer, it's a pretty broad sort of bucket, if you will. Kids was our first priority last year, and we'll continue to focus on it. It's a, it's a huge growth area for us. It's a great area for developers, so we'll continue to expand on that. Beyond that, lifestyle apps, and that is, again, in and of itself, a very large area, you know, apps focused on food health and fitness, fashion, uh, travel, um, those are really, you know, anything really in that, but even spirituality, believe it or not, we sell a lot of Bibles, um, and therefore we sell a lot of Bible apps. Um, we have a channel dedicated to that area, just Bible apps, um, because our customers are looking for them and asking for them. Um, so there's, there's very broad areas that we focus on, but in general, anything related to what a consumer might be looking for, so we're not necessarily enterprise focused, that, that's clear, that's not our, our niche, that's not our area, so we're not really looking for enterprise type apps. Although productivity is a huge um, area of growth for us right now. Any, any type of productivity apps. Any other questions? I can show the device. Um, I have the products with me, so if you want to see the new model, I can show it to you. Thank you.
Thanks.